She sells seashells by the seashore. A common tongue twister that we've all heard before. But is it really twisting your tongue? I'd go so far to suggest that it's twisting the mind more than the tongue. All you're doing is saying a group of words in a particular order that presents significant challenges to the brain, right? If we're taking it literally, <laughs> and we are, the ability to twist your tongue hmm, is not defined by how quickly we can say an impractical sentence. It's defined by genetics and environment, making the title of tongue twister pretty much wrong. I researched that. Poorly researched, but at least I tried. Right, Mum and Dad? But isn't all of this beside the point? The real intrigue should lie in the tongue twister itself. She sells seashells by the seashore. Who is she, the cat's mother? And if so, what the hell is a mother cat doing selling seashells by the seashore? Surely cats would hate, hate the beach. Call me crazy, but sand and salt water en masse don't scream feline utopia to me. And if we can bring ourselves to get past all of that, if we can, then what the hell is she doing conducting her seashell business on the beach itself? Payment issues spring to mind immediately. Is it cash only? Is F possible available? If so, how? She's on a beach. ABN, tax file number, a legitimate business plan. I'll believe it when I see it, Miss Kitty. It stinks to high heaven of a drug front to me. Oh, Charlie, you're taking it too seriously. I hear them cry from the cheap seats. Cool your jets, you peanut. Well, that's crap. This is up late, and I'm going to use this box of soap on which I stand to bust down some prejudiced, tongue-twisted stigma that leaves children everywhere, everywhere, embarrassed daily because of an inability to say some hard shit. No, 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 you can't say it. Just shut up. Shut up, you bullies. The kids that can't say it are probably the only ones who see through the obvious flaws of this societal norm. And that is how you respond when someone asks you to say, she sells seashells by the seashore. Oh, look at that, a Melbourne tram. Best thing you'll ever see, apart from this, the State Library at night. What a city. What a place. Who wouldn't want to live there? Guys, it's time for Up Late with Charlie Ranger. Tonight on the show, our special guest is Jennifer Down. And we have the amazing band Alaria in the house. Tonight on the show, we have the amazing band Alaria in the house playing for us. Alaria are bringing the rich musical culture of Nigeria to people all around the world. That's going to be absolutely amazing. We also have the young and extremely talented author Jennifer Down in for a chat. Her first novel, Our Magic Hour, released earlier this year, has been receiving absolutely wonderful reviews. Good evening, guys. My name's Charlie Ranger. And, and with Jennifer in, I thought we'd turn our attention towards literature. Now, when I say literature, <laughs> I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking Fifty Shades of Grey or Twilight or, or maybe Scientology, the fundamentals of thought. But you'd be wrong because that's not literature. That's crap. No, what I mean when I say literature is Thai storybooks for kids with powerful moral messages at the end. Specifically, The Wicked Elephant. Now, I'd like you to do me a favour and take yourselves back to the days when you loved the bloody socks off play school because it's story time, guys. <clears throat> Here we go. Who's ready? Once upon a time, there were a parent bird. They lived on the tree near a river. One day, there was a wicked elephant walking by. The elephant broke all the trees along the way it passed. Mr. Elephant, would you please not tear down the tree where our babies lived? Begged the parent bird. The wicked elephant did not listen. It put its trunk around the trees and shook the tree until all baby birds fell dead in the river. I bet you didn't see that coming. 
Then the two birds went to other animals and told them about bad story. The porcupine and the bee promised, we will help you to punish that wicked elephant. So the animals went to the elephant and said, wicked elephant, we will punish you. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen next. By that time, a swarm of bee, which were waiting for a right time, flew to sting the elephant's eyes. It now became blind as you can see with the blood pouring out of the elephant's eyes. Didn't know we had blood in our eyes. Then porcupines came up and shot their quills on the elephant's feet. The wicked elephant cried out painfully. With the blind eyes, the elephant straggled and ran into a lot of trees before stopping near a cliff. So it stepped toward the noise and finally fell from the cliff and died. The moral of the story, guys, of course, is good man will be rewarded, but wicked one will be punished. Wow. How about that moral, guys? Good man will be rewarded, but wicked one will be punished. Just taking a minute to analyse this message we've got here. Good man will be rewarded. Now, I assume in this case, good man represents the parent birds that lost their children in tragic circumstances. Now, their reward, I'm a little less clear on. Is it banding together with a bunch of your mates, taking the law into your own hands to blind and immobilise your child's killer before leading them off a cliff to fall to their death? All of this rather than reporting it to the relevant authorities. Now, the other half of the moral is obvious. Uh, wicked one will be punished. Well, <laughs> that's self-explanatory. I'm going to go ahead and suggest 25 to life would have sufficed, but hey, death by falling works as a punishment as well. Now, what I'm taking from the story is more along the lines of, and I've top pointed this, elephants are dicks, that's number one. Uh, the animals on page six looked way too happy at the thought of killing someone, and Thai storybooks have a long way to go before they become bedtime stories. Now, I'm not sure how good the reward of banding together with your mates to kill someone is, considering the elephant deliberately and successfully drowned your kids in the drink earlier. But that, my friends, is what literature is all about. So there it is, guys, The Wicked Elephant, an amazing book. Um, I do also have another one that we might get to later if we've got time. It's called The Bullfrog and the Cow. Uh, <laughs> so this one, I bet you can't guess what happens in this one. Um, it's equally as messed up as The Wicked Elephant. But, um, you know, there's still a moral at the end there, which is, which is always nice. So, guys, it's a big show planned tonight, uh, as we say. We've got Jennifer in. We've got the band in. We're going to go to our first break, and when we come back, we'll have Jennifer on the couch ready for an interview. <laughs> Guys, welcome back to Up Late with Charlie Ranger. Um, we've got our second ever guest in the house right now. Now, um, it's Jennifer Down. Her debut novel, Our Magic Hour, was picked up by text publishers after shortlisted in the Victorian Premier's Literary Award in 2014. It was released this year to some fantastic reviews. Jennifer, hi. Thank you for having me. No, no <laughs> worries. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, for those who haven't read our magic hour. Uh, can you describe the story, but also like what it is for you specifically? Um, yeah, so it's a it's a, a novel about a group of friends um, living in Melbourne and they're dealing with um, a, a pretty big trauma, which is the the death of um, one of their own. I guess they're all um, in their twenties, um, and it's not um, at all autobiographical. But I guess for me, it was important to see. Um, I wanted to see some literature set in the city that I live in and that I've grown up in um, and something that kind of reflected the time of, um, of my friends and I in contemporary Melbourne. Do you, you say it's not autobiographical, but like considering it is set like in the city you live in and um, you know, places you would know, do you find it just naturally sort of seeps in anyway, sort of you, how you view Melbourne as well? Oh, I'm sure. Like I'm sure um, it's, you know, they're, they're places that I frequent with my friends. Yeah. Um, so in, in a kind of spatial sense, for sure. Um, but yeah, plot-wise, it's not, not so much. Yeah, right, <laughs> of course, of course. Um, what makes you want to tell a story? I mean, you're, you're an author. Like, what, why do you write? Why do you want to tell a story and get it out there? 
I, they're like two really separate things. Like the, the wanting to tell a story is, is one thing, um, but often, um, at least when I first start writing a story, I'm doing it for myself yeah. um, and the getting it out there is quite a separate part and it, right. I, it's definitely the hardest part. Yeah. Um, it's quite enough. I'm quite satisfied doing writing something for my own purposes to try and keep refining it and making it better, but yeah. it's, it's much more daunting to put it out there. So do, do you have, you know, on your, on your computer or whatever, do you have like a bunch of stories that you've started and, and never just got put into a public domain or...? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I, there are some ideas that I have that just don't go anywhere. Yeah. And it's like, I think the idea is good, but it, do, it doesn't have legs for yeah. the time being. So it's a, yeah, there's a lot of unfinished drafts. And That's actually something that I, I find really interesting and it'd be great to get your take. Like, when does an idea for you become something more? Like, how do you know when it's going to roll over and, and you sort of go, oh, no, this is one that I can definitely run with and, and turn it into a full-length novel or whatever it might be? Um, I think it's when you start to get a good sense of the characters um, right. and you can sort of feel the story grow out of them. But it's also um, usually as soon as I know what the end of the story will be. Um, it's a lot easier for short fiction, I think. But so you, you work knowing what, how you want to wrap the story up? Yeah, I don't work backwards, but I usually start with the... I, I know where it's going to start and I know where it will end. That's a massive spoiler alert. I know. <laughs> yeah, it sucks. It makes it, <laughs> yeah. The whole thing is really boring. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. There's no Sorry. point. <laughs> um, I also wanted to know, because obviously as a writer, you know, you obviously have all your projects that you're working on. Do you have any guilty reads on your shelf? Um, I don't really, like, I don't think there's such a thing as a guilty read because I just think you should own what you, I just think you should be proud of what you love. Yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. I, I'm sure I read some really bad stuff. Were there any books from your past, like when you were a lot younger, that really stand out that kind of got you into More that? just stuff that like I'm a bit embarrassed about reading now because I thought it was really groundbreaking at the time. Goosebumps? Is it yeah, exactly. Oh man, yeah. I loved Goosebumps. Yeah, well, it was really formative for me. No stuff that like I thought <laughs> I read when I was fifteen and sixteen, and like like everybody else thought yeah, it was really profound. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it ended up that everyone else was reading it. And what what is this? You haven't said it yet. Oh, I, like stuff like um, like the Beat Generation. Right. Um, writers. Like I remember the first time I read Kerouac and I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah. And then like even two years later, you're like, well, that's what everybody was reading. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There's a whole world of other much more diverse voices yeah, out there that yeah. I need to get into. Do you, do you find yourself doing that now? Um, kind of going, I don't, I'm not sure it's the right way to phrase the question, but do you avoid mainstream like authors and stuff so that you can get find out really what's going on in all the sort of nooks and crannies of the literary world or no I don't I don't think I avoid mainstream but I do try to read diversely and I don't think diversity is really reflected in the Australian mainstream so I do um, a couple of years ago I decided I was I had a weird goal that I wanted to read 75 percent writers of color for instance because right. I just noticed I write down all the books that I read and yeah. I noticed that my list was kind of a little bit whitewashed and I think that's probably reflective of the Australian lit scene so I tried to um, about four years ago I tried to really shift my reading habits um, and that's probably the only conscious thing I do. Yeah was that was that just with Australian authors or was that like all no authors, do you mean? no um, that's all all authors yeah. I try to I try to read um, yeah, as diversely as possible. Has that, have you seen any like change from doing that, like in the way you approach writing, or? Um, probably, I don't know about writing so much, um, because I don't want to tell stories that I'm not the best person to tell, sure. or that I'm not qualified to tell. Um, there are some characters that I wouldn't quite feel comfortable writing because I think I'm not the best person to do it because I don't have that life experience. Yeah, sure. And somebody else, um, like, why would I write? Um, from the perspective of a queer woman of colour when a queer woman of colour has that first-hand yeah, experience sure, and she sure. can do it a lot better than me and she probably doesn't necessarily have as many opportunities because that's the kind of unfortunate lay of the land in the current publishing climate. And I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, sort of your own experiences in writing and like you're still quite young. You were telling me just before you turned 26 last week. Yep. Happy birthday. Thank you. Did you get a cake? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be the person that made that for you. <laughs> oh. 
that's not memorable. Sorry, no, I, I've, I, it's like been four birthdays in my life in the last week, ten days, so I just had to not remember. Not all yours, though. No, I didn't turn 26 four times. Great. So it <laughs> yeah, was enough. Um, sorry, I'll get back to the question. You, you yourself, you're, you're quite young um, and you've got this successful novel out there now. Um, do you find that brings with it a lot of pressure for, for what you do next or...? Um, no, because like, um, it's, I feel pressure from myself because I like to, I like to work hard, but um, like the Melbourne lit scene or the Australian lit scene is so small yeah. and to, to feel like there's pressure, like my book is one of so many that have come out this year yeah. and there are so many amazing books that have come out this year by debut Australian novelists. That, um, and people forget about new books so quickly, yeah. it kind of doesn't, they're getting hung up on sure. your book or yeah, your experience. So. Um, on that, I read that uh, I think next year you're going to release um, a collection of short stories. Mm -hmm. What was the decision that made you go towards the short story now as your next project? Um, well, I'd kind of been working on short stories for a little while. Um, while I was um, editing my novel and I think I, I sort of cut my teeth on short stories. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a really tough form but it's one that I really like working with um, because kind of the architecture is, is for me more manageable than the, something as big as a novel but also at sentence level short stories have to be perfect. You can't yeah. afford any guff that you can kind of get away yeah, with in a right. novel um, and so I like the challenge of it um, and I also like the kind of diversity of being able to move um, between different worlds rather than being stuck in the same the same scene for a long time. So is, is that something you think you'll sort of keep pursuing throughout your whole career that you might sort of just be dipping your toe in? I hope so, yeah. I think it's a really, um, I don't know, for me, I, I feel like it teaches me, reading short stories and writing them, it kind of teaches me um, something new every time and I think it, it, it's a really good way, to, it makes me a better writer, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I have a question. Being now a successful author, mm -hmm. does everybody <laughs> does everybody at Christmas time go, hey, so you know how we've got to write Christmas cards, can you just write mine for me? Does everyone always go to you and say, can you just read over this for me and just, you know? Um, actually, my only, like, skill as a friend is being able to proofread people's essays. Oh, really? Um, oh, that's a terrible skill. I know, you it's, it's make shitty. I, yeah. Can we um, delete that, actually? <laughs> So um, that's, it's not so much the writing, but I do, I do um, some, some proofreading on the sly for really? the pals, yeah. Do you do that as like a job or just as a favour? Um, well, both. It's, it's like editing is my, my day job, but okay, um, I, so yeah, so it's not like a great hard <laughs> if I, I literally do it for a living. <laughs> sure. um, and it's a nice, it's a nice way to be able to help people out when yeah, they're yeah, stressed yeah, exactly. about uni. <laughs> um, do you have a goal that you want to achieve with your writing or with your career or is it kind of so early and you're trying all these different things that you're not really sure what what that goal might end up being? Um, somebody tweeted at me the other day and said um, they <laughs> finished my book and then broke up with their long-term boyfriend. Great. And somebody else chimed in on that conversation and said I finished the book and quit a job that I hated. And I was like, <laughs> wow, what a thing to like, you know, make people have big life decisions. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. not it though. Um, no, I don't really have any goals. I just kind of have to keep plodding along and seeing what happens. And is that kind of the same with, with the, like the stories that you develop and you come up with that you, they just sort of come to you or, or is there, do you have an area that you really want to write about next or? Um, yeah, I think I kind of always mine the same things, which are things that I'm inherently fascinated in and will we'll keep working over until, I don't know, I get sick of them, um, which is yeah, just um, human psychology and trauma and memory. Um, and there are so many ways to write about those things um, and the relationships and spaces between people. Um, I can't imagine ever getting sick of that. So. Awesome. Yeah. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was me. wonderful to have you. Um, guys, the book is our magic hour. Um, go get it. You can buy it online. You can buy it everywhere. In bookshops. Bookshops? Yeah, you can just walk That's right crazy. in there and flop out so the credit card. Exist? And, yeah. like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, guys, we're going to throw to a break. And when we come back, we have our amazing band, Alaria, to finish us off for tonight. Now, 
it's time for everybody to be him or herself. One, two, three, go! everybody. Be yourself and you're wrong. 
Don't compromise your faith. Follow your inner moonlight. Don't hide the madness in you. The madness of another is another man's usefulness. Find out who you are and do it on purpose. Be yourself. Ah. Come on, you gotta be yourself, man. Be yourself. Don't compromise your faith. Follow your inner moonlight. Don't hide the madness in you. The madness of another is another man's usefulness. Find out who you are and do it on purpose. Be yourself. Be yourself, oh my brother. Oh, be yourself. Be yourself.